Hopefully, yeah. Okay, so that's us recording. Um, so before I introduce our presenters, just a wee housekeeping note. Um, we'll have opportunities for questions and discussion both during and after the presentation. There'll be a break partway through the presentation for any questions or any discussion, and then we'll have a longer time at the end. So if you have questions or comments, if you please pop them into the chat box and you can open that up by clicking on the speech icon in the menu bar. And during the discussion and question sessions, you can also put up your hand to ask a question. And Lisa, who will be facilitating the chat, um, she'll invite you to turn on your, your microphone. Um, so it's my honour and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniela and Dr. Duncan Mersika, my colleagues in the School of Education and Social Work at the University of Dundee, and to share with you a little about their professional histories. So Daniela is a lecturer and practising educational psychologist in a, local, a Scottish local authority. Her research interest is in critically problematizing the assumptions that underpin educational practice with children and deconstructing situations in which decisions are made concerning children in schools. Duncan is a founding member of our CIRA Inclusive Practice Network and a senior lecturer in teacher education. For Duncan's sins, Duncan is also my next door office neighbour in the office in Dundee. Um, and he's, he's survived being my neighbour for over a year now. Um, he has experience of teaching across the age range in both mainstream and special educational settings. And his research draws upon French post-structuralist philosophers to think through educational issues, in particular, those related to diversity and otherness, inclusion and disability and critiquing educational research and its methods. So on behalf of the network, we're delighted to welcome Daniela and Duncan this afternoon to, set, to share some of their findings from their research into teaching and learning in lockdown. Over to you and thank you. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much. We are delighted to be here and um, really, really thrilled to be able to share um, the work that we have been doing alongside some colleagues of ours um, in Dundee at the School of Education and Social Work. Um, so I think I'd better just share my PowerPoint slides and I'll be talking you through them and then Duncan will be as well. So here we are. Um, and I think you can see this. So that's us. Um, and the research question that we shall be addressing in this presentation, and which we have been talking about, um, which has been directing the research, is what are primary school educators' experiences of teaching during the COVID-19 lockdown in Scotland? Now, a, a little note about the research process itself. Um, this this all happened when I was um, uh, availing myself of the one hour exercise that was allowed in the initial lockdown. I had a chat with a dear uh, educational psychologist colleague and we talked about goodness knows how this you know, is impacting on everybody, on teachers, on parents and uh, on the identity that they have. Um, and so when I got home, um, we put together Duncan and I put together a proposal and sent it off for ethics. And we were lucky enough to get a, a very quick reply. Um, and then we were able to share this with colleagues within the School of Education and Social Work. Um, and we got uh, quite a few people who were interested in taking part. So we said, let's get the experiences of lockdown of these teachers. Um, and we had to set some parameters. I think we were quite regretful about some of the parameters we had to set, uh, mainly that they would be primary school teachers, um, because we thought, let's try and talk about um, the experience of teachers who have constant contact with the same group of children and having that taken away and replaced with um, digital, digital contact. 
Um, also because um, most of the learning, as we will be discussing with young children, is mediated through parents, and we try to capture a little bit of that as well in the process. So how would these primary school teachers experience having parents mediating the learning um, they give to children? Um, and obviously head teachers of primary schools, and we decided also to limit it to Scotland. There was the possibility of going international, um, but it was difficult to organize. And um, obviously we are parents of children who were being homeschooled as well, and we had uh, all our teaching at the university went online as well. So it's been it's been interesting to organize all this stuff together. We decided to have interviews with with um, with teachers, um, in-depth interviews where we were, what has it been like for you? Um, and the questions which we posed would be semi-structured, um, where a conversation was encouraged between those who interviewed and those who participated. We also had an online survey for those teachers who uh, struggled to find the time to connect um, for various reasons, and we had a few responses of those as well. Well, together we have um, 60 interviews. So uh, an open invitation was posted on social media so that volunteers um, could come forward to participate. They, an email address was created just for this, and then uh, appointments were made online with the interviewer by the second week of lockdown, because we were very keen to get the experience in real time. And this is not, uh, af you know, after after it happened. This is while it was happening. And obviously there are differences in accounts when uh, interviews took place in the second week, in the, uh, in the third week, and then also after the Easter holidays and later on in the summer term. Um, then the interviews were listened to. Um, transcriptions are still underway. They are not easy. Uh, not easy things to, to, to carry out, um, especially because we... There was no funding for this project, so... People who give you funding don't like it that you uh, start your project and then ask for funding. So I, uh, we needed to just make sure that we, we, you know, we got going with what we wanted to do. We were very keen to protect confidentiality and anonymity of those participating, and we were very, very clear from the outset that we would not be uh, uh, letting anybody identify the local authority where they worked, because we didn't want people to comment about how local authority were guiding or not, etc. Um, things were quite difficult for everybody, structures, individuals. So I think we were all struggling to find a way forward. Um, and we didn't think it was fair to identify structures or individuals and, and make comments on that. Analysis is underway. Um, uh, it, it has been happening throughout the summer and still ongoing. We, um, uh, we have formed groups of, interview with, of ourselves with interviewers from the university who participated from the School of Education. And these little groups are analyzing clusters of interviews um, so that um, we would like to publish papers. We have uh, one has been accepted, two underway, and uh, five papers are currently in progress, um, which is very exciting um, because the wealth of information um, and experiences that teachers have shared um, really wants to come out and wants to be shared with others. We are currently also planning a website um, so that the ongoing analysis can be updated from, from time to time. Uh, and last point here, which I want to say again at the end, is a huge thank you to all the teachers and head teachers to, who gave us their time and who shared their lives with us in that hour, hour and a half that we uh, interviewed them. And also... What was interesting is that teachers and head teachers wanted to speak and they, they took this opportunity to have a conversation and the reflection of the moment. Yes. So that was they were much. eager. They were eager to do so. Um, and also to thank um, the colleagues who joined us um, in this brave venture, I should say. <laughs> um, I think we can proceed. No, no it's, 
I just pressed it. Awesome. Um, so some points to keep in mind, it's all part of the of the analysis as well. We need to understand that um, the stories told are those of teachers who are willing to share. Um, there are obviously teachers who are going through some difficult times or perhaps teachers who are just not interested in, in sharing um, and we are not representative of all teachers by, by any means. Um, all the all the experiences are unique and we in our epistemological view we believe that even us engaging with this information engaging with the data we are influenced by our own experiences of this phenomenon as well um, so we are eager for the voices to come out um, as an i said we are not being representative and our outcomes are not to be generalized so one might ask, what is this for? I think our research um, aims to give to give an understanding of what it has been like for some teachers. So those listening, um, perhaps yourselves or somebody who is reading a paper, um, might possibly resonate with some of the points which we put forward. And this could be either positive or negative. Um, Another point regarding the timeline, um, a, a lot of teachers mentioned about, uh, they mentioned how the run up to lockdown took place and there were various. Some um, talked about a lot of excitement, a lot of uncertainty, confusion, um, and we thought this was particularly poignant. In fact, that she mentioned words like grief, um, sadness. It was as though there had been a death in the last two days before lockdown started, where the teacher described suddenly where the day before she had been receiving hugs from children and interacting with children happily and not thinking that there was not going to be a tomorrow in the school. Suddenly these last two days, um, everything was quite quiet and, and unsure in terms of how they could be together. Head teachers interviewed also talked about the anticipation of guidelines. Um, how uh, can a school decide what to do or should we wait for the local authority to tell us? And the, the quote which comes, I need to warn you, it is a big one and I have highlighted bits and, and large bits of it because I, 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 I wanted the whole quote to come through so that you could see the energy of this head teacher telling us how it was. Um, and here she says they were first waiting for the uh, local authority to give guidance. And then she said she kind of freaked out, you know, in the nicest possible way. Um, and then came up with a plan a week before the lockdown started. And uh, they had roles which they wanted to fulfill on the, on the days of the week. They had 100 hours of parents volunteering and produce their own guidance as a school. And they said, when the local authority guidance does come, we will make sure that we are in line with it. But for now, we need to know what it is we're going to do. And the beautiful part of this quote is towards the end, of course, where they said, our ethos is that we want the children to feel connected to us, whether or not they are seeing us or hearing us, whether they are in school or not. So we will be dividing our session um, in two particular areas. We have for today's presentation, we've thought of thinking of sharing with you two teams. It's about teacher identity and then teaching and learning. The issue of identity probably is cuts across all these teams. I think this is the most predominant idea. Also, we'd like to say that there is no subtitle parents but parents will come across all the different in the both teams and sub teams. So that runs across. We have to keep in mind that these are, we have not interviewed parents. These are teachers' perceptions and experiences of parents. So it's taken from that perspective. Um, and so, so we purposefully said, we are not going to do a subtitle for parents because they are so, it prevails so much throughout. So we, we put the asterisk there, so just so that you would know that. So the first part, um, in terms of teacher identity, it was really interesting to, to notice the importance of the building of the school. 
and how this had an I think we, we were not aware as such and perhaps others will disagree but we were not aware as such of how much this building has an impact on what happens inside the roles the procedures the relationships that have it inside and so we are understanding the impact of the school building because we are feeling the uh, impact of the lack of it at the moment um, schools and it came very clearly creates some people who are within the school and some people who are outside of the school but obviously due to covid this was challenged yes so um, uh, distance and proximity between educators when I say educators, I'm referring to both teachers and head teachers and families changed. So um, um, uh, sometimes, uh, for example, we're talking about families that are hard to reach. Um, they seem to, we, we, we were talking about this, but they seem to become harder to reach in some cases. But then if teachers were in their own homes and head teachers were in their own homes, sometimes the geographical proximity was narrower than it was mm -hmm. with the school. Also because the school walls weren't there. Um, and uh, yes, so that's about distance and proximity. Um, the head teacher uh, reported, many head teachers reported actually that they are con they are accustomed to be the intermediary between the parents and teachers and uh, they found this a little bit challenging because they felt the need to protect teachers sometimes from some comments that parents were making because of course parents had a view of teacher teaching and learning that they didn't have before and so obviously parents had opinions about what they were seeing and and the communication between the parents and the teachers became easier. It didn't need to go to pass through the schools. It was almost online and they could almost go directly. And the head teachers, a number of head teachers spoke about, you know, we need to take care of our teachers because of um, parents speaking directly to teachers. And sometimes this created a little bit of difficulties. So we had the head teacher say, we had the we had the head teacher saying um, um, I want to make sure that the work that is posted online needs to be consistent, although some stuff is more comfortable uh, with digital media than others, so that all my staff meets the same standard. Um, so she was very aware of this. Um, in terms of distance and proximity, also there was the issue about. Um, how teachers and head teachers reported being close, going going actually to, to people's homes and dropping off parcels outside, food parcels, um, stationery, perhaps the Chromebooks that eventually arrived, um, and the connections that were made because they could not see them in school. The reaching out was very, very uh, touching actually. One particular teacher um, also uh, mentioned the school as being quite closed off in normal times pre-COVID and she mentioned that um, because of the Dumbling shoot shooting um, about 25 years ago, schools had to become a little bit more protected and because the school building is out of the equation at the moment, then some reaching out and some more closeness was was seen to be possible. I, we thought that was quite interesting. Um, and so um, there was also the issue that um, because the teaching and learning became more visible, parents reported to head teachers who reported to us that they felt more part of the school now. So we have, as you see, the example at the bottom uh, mentioning the video of the school assembly parents told the head teacher, please do not go back to the normal way after COVID goes because we've really enjoyed this and we want to continue this. Um, one last point regarding the, the, uh, the online presence of the, of the, of the teachers. Um, when the head teacher mentioned um, wanting to protect teachers and wanting to protect the school from the scrutiny which had increased, um, some examples were given which were interesting. Uh, what about families who had twins 
who were not in the same class, for example, or who had siblings who were obviously not in the same class. Um, you, you can't have a teacher in one class and a teacher of another posting in a very different way. So that was a tension that schools had to face as well. Um, so teachers here talked about how the contact and communication with children really, really, uh, they felt the lack of this and it, uh, it impacted on their identity. We're highlighting the word purpose over there because they, they really uh, felt this. I think this was one of the most significant points. We know that teachers and primary school teachers were both trained as primary school teachers. So we know the connection that there is a great connection between the teacher and the students. Um, but the lack of this, con the lack of the presence. So here it is the teacher's body within a classroom and this has been removed. This has been absent now. Some teachers talk about losing a purpose. Their, their purpose is not being fulfilled in any way. So, so this is a very interesting and this idea that there's a future, it's so future oriented. After lockdown, we will be again with our students. Mm -hmm. So this longing for the student is very, very interesting. And it came across, I think, most of our, um, from the most interviews. Yes. So these are two chunks as well, um, where we have teachers um, who are carrying out numerous small acts of kindness. Um, the quote is from a head teacher describing what she, what her act, her teachers in her school were were carrying out. There are small acts, but within the situation that um, of of lockdown, they are quite big acts. So here we have two diff two examples: teachers phoning and checking with parents. So this is an example of a parent who with three kids. And she asked the teacher to help out and the teacher after getting permission, she did a phone call and then she continued this phone call once a week and you have the conversation there. What is interesting in the first quote um, is that it's, it's, it was helpful for the parent, but as you will read, it's helpful as well for the mm -hmm. teacher. So it's a double thing. It's not just the teacher giving something, but the teacher is also receiving something. Mm -hmm. And this receiving very often occurs in the classroom, occurs yeah. with the children. And here the receiving is being done because she phoned a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and also and the second example is about reaching out to the homes, like we, like we mentioned before. Um, one of the head teachers did mention the um, directive given by the by the union, um, and she was a little bit upset by it. She said, effectively, when the union said that the teachers weren't to phone children at home, um, they stopped kindness, um, and it, uh, she 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 made it quite strongly this point. And this was an, an example of all these. I know obviously there are others. They are example of actions which would not take would not have taken place um, had it not been you know this unprecedented mm -hmm. situation. Especially the second example of dropping and taking parcels, food. There were situations. There are situations where hot meals were taken on a regular daily basis. Yes. So we have teachers speaking about this, and a lot of teachers were volunteering to support this. Yes. One teacher in particular had just dropped off a parcel um, and then got a call from the school saying, uh, unfortunately, the neighbor stole the parcel. Could you please take another one? <laughs> um, uh, Following so. from the previous point, we have a number of teachers talking that they felt guilty that they're not, not doing enough for their children. And here we have this issue of guilt. It comes across quite repetitively in various interviews with one of the teachers saying that she is devastated, that she's not being in class. Mm -hmm. This idea of not being in class came across and it's, it reminds us of what the normal role of the teacher is to be in a class. Mm -hmm. And here the absence of a class. Um, That's you know, a big impact. That's a big impact. Um, this this next slide um, talks about um, the, the this way is, I'll just we're talking about teachers' identity, so this is how this this next team 
something fits it in within teacher's identity. Yes. Sorry, I stopped you. No, it's okay. Um, how teachers are, are juggling to take care of their own children and then working with students um, online. So this particular teacher uh, wakes up early before her own son is up. Uh, we are assuming that this son is quite a baby because he naps for an hour in the afternoon and then she tries to work and then her husband takes him out and then she tries to work and she finds herself going back to a habit which she had, it took her 11 years to stop to work at night time. She doesn't want to go back to that. It says I, a lot of teachers mentioned um, how difficult it was to do this. And um, at the bottom, there is the point that teachers with young children sometimes needed to take them with them to the hubs because they wouldn't have anybody to look after them. And we mentioned children here, but we also need to say that there were teachers with other dependents that they uh, needed to care for, which um, also made, made it quite a challenge. Um, and there were differences in teachers' expectations here. So, uh, so you, we've, we've all heard, you do what you can, which has been quite comforting. I think this is the, the attitude our, our children's school took, you do what you can, and we did do what we did, what we could. Um, but uh, we had uh, head teachers say that the teaching staff really does need to be available from nine o'clock until the end of the school day. Um, which I'm, I'm, I'm thinking must have been quite challenging for some of the teachers. Um, and another head at the bottom there said she, she noticed that this particular teacher felt pressure to be on CISO all day and she put a stop to it and told her this is when you go and then you check perhaps for half an hour um, and then you can respond towards the, end of, towards the end of the day. But you're not to spend your whole days on this. But it, 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 shows, uh, it shows us a little bit the, diff the diversity of ways people were, teachers were doing or dealing with this. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a uniformity across mm -hmm. Scotland, not even sometimes uniformity within the same local authority. So it was very much about this in relation to the school where um, things were happening. But we this second quote where, you know, they have to be nine to three, it wasn't there were a few moments when it came across. It wasn't the overarming idea, but it came across from some schools, from some teachers we interviewed. Uh, the prevalent one was that teachers told parents that, and the head teacher also was supportive of teachers um, to be able to cope with their own uh, home situation as well. Um, teacher empathy came through a lot um, for parents and carers where um, they, they, this particular teacher said, you know, I've been in here for the last five days and you feel like pulling your hair out at times with, with the three daughters. So if you were to change that into an environment which is challenging, where mom might have lost her job, dad might have lost his job, worried where money is coming from, access to, to certain things, it just makes that kind of thing even more and more challenging. Um, Teachers also empathized with, with parents of children with a disability. Yes. Um, and we also had teachers who had children with a disability yes. as well. Um, and they they could relate their own experiences with those of the parents. And and the details that, that they spoke about, for example, one teacher spoke about how um, her son um, seeing videos from school of, of the teachers reacted and he was upset. She was upset. And at the same time, she's trying to do videos for her own children. And she's thinking, will this actually help or will it not? Because it doesn't really help my son. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the thinking that it was going on. And you see the reflective processes mm -hmm. that teachers were having at that moment. Yes. Um, and the, the quote at the bottom is quite nice, where a, a teacher back from maternity leave appreciated this extra time that she got with her own son, which was nice to hear. Um, in terms of uh, collaborative work, it, it, schools that were bigger and had more classes than uh, in, in the same year group, uh, we had accounts of, of teachers who worked together um, uh, and, 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 they, and supported each other, whereas other smaller schools, perhaps those who 
were a little bit more specialist, where they had composite classes, for example, the Gallic school as well, um, and where they needed to differentiate within the same class. Um, obviously, the workload for the for each individual person was much much um, larger. And also rural schools. And rural schools as well. So th th this this in the first example in this first quote. We have these three teachers working together, and you can see that from the quote that the work is distributed better. Mm -hmm. Whilst, whilst with specialist schools or smaller schools, this was a, a bit of a concern. Uh, some more examples of, of teachers sharing resources and ideas with each other um, um, and, and, and learning from each other, which is really nice. And also we, have, we had um, accounts of teachers who felt that it was becoming a little bit competitive sometimes in terms of how online resources were shown and uh, perhaps shared. It, it came across quite often as well, this idea of competitiveness. It's mm -hmm. always, it, it didn't come across the teachers we interviewed, but they all knew about teachers who yes. were competitive. Yes. So this is interesting. <laughs> They mentioned um, some social activities which which were held um, and it was nice to hear, you know, gosh, I didn't realize I needed that. Um, where obviously I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of laughter, shared laughter. Um, so I'm assuming that they had quite a few giggles at the staff quiz. But staff, staff quiz, the, the idea of a quiz came across. Throughout. <laughs> Throughout. Um, the last um, sub theme in this in this overarching theme is is about um, pastoral care. I cannot. Uh, this is completely uh, not doing justice to the huge, um, you know, pre the prevailing uh, notion of pastoral care that came throughout the interviews. There was a big concern about children's safety and well-being, um, both by on behalf of teachers and head teachers. Um, and we have this head teacher who said, what an amazing school um, that, uh, what an amazing staff I have. I hadn't realized how, uh, how much they take initiative, they reach out to families, they, they, they have a feeling about when a family might be struggling and they try to reach out and make creative overtures to reach out to these children. Um, the head teachers in particular seem to have their ear on the ground and had a network of the community supports um, that were available and um, they mobilized quite a bit of services so that these vulnerable families could be supported. Also, they have a way how to gather information. Mm -hmm. So if they hear that the family is struggling, even if the family has not you know, told the school about it, they would still try to find ways and excuses to make sure that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. So this has been quite interesting. So in this slide, I want to talk about, well, I am talking about um, families who, who needed support and who, who asked for support and head teachers and teachers who made themselves available. We have a head teacher saying that, uh, for example, a, uh, mother needed to contact her at 11 o'clock at night because that was the time when she could talk about the uh, imminent separation that she was going through with her husband with with her uh, child not around. And, and what also some head teachers said were was that um, they came to know about stories which usually they would not have come to know at school. Mm -hmm. So if she marital um, issues came across quite quite strongly, so they get to know even deeper because usually head teachers know a lot about what's happening to families. But it seems that this moment, the clo the 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 moment pro provided a space where teach head teachers were more consulted on personal issues mm -hmm. and issues were exacerbated as yes. well because of the situation. And then the the second slide about pastoral care is, is about families who are vulnerable and those who seem to become harder to reach. So um, uh, there were, you know, there was a big concern about these families. Conversations changed. I, I mentioned the one where the pastor was left for the family. Uh, staff and head teachers said they were anything, they would do anything to get a peek at the children and see that things are okay and try to see 
by checking the eyes, you know, of children in some way to, to know that things are okay. This takes us back to the first point to when you don't have a physical school, the school building. Because when children come to school, somehow the school provides for them. When the school, when children are far to reach, then the head teachers and teachers had to go otherwise and maybe other agencies, but otherwise there was no way how you could connect with them. Mm -hmm. So th this last quote over here talks about attendance at the hubs. Um, and it's quite um, concerning when you when you read it, um, the amount of vulnerable children that there were there in this particular area, they counted around 120, 130 children. And yet only five or six of those children attended the hubs. And the person talking to us um, said that uh, one of the things that they thought was a, was a difficulty was that you, as a parent, you have to sign your child in and out every day of the hub. And a lot of these vulnerable children would make their own way to school in the morning. And so because a parent needed to accompany them to the hub, perhaps this is why the children were, did not avail themselves of the hub. And so it was quite concerning for this person, um, rightly so, to think about vulnerable children being in, a, in the home environment, which was not um, exactly, you know, which, which made them vulnerable. This last uh, bit from this theme is a lovely uh, quote. It's a little story about this head teacher who said that this boy didn't come out of the house for four weeks. I'm going to let you read it and we're going to have a three, four minute break where I, I, we welcome your reactions, your questions, your reflections, um, and perhaps you want to put the kettle on or something. Um, so I'll leave this on for, uh, for just a minute so that you can read it and then we can remove the slides for a bit. I think you removed the, the slide. Can you still see the slide? I can. Okay, yeah. good. Yes. So, so I think I, I can remove it, yes. So if you have questions or comments, if you want to put those into the chat box or pop your hand up, and Lisa will facilitate this short bit for us. I think everyone's gone to the kettle, Diane. <laughs> I was thinking that too. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, we, we have we have a, a lovely comment from Gillian in the chat saying that this is so powerful. And I, th I think she's she's right. And several people are ag agreeing with her there in chat and liking that message. Mm -hmm. um, OK, Diane, I'm sorry. I, as I was I was trying to change my earphones because I'm trying to um, charge at the same time. I missed, are we having a wave break or can we take questions now? I think the formal break comes when we finish the talk. This is just a quick, you oh, know, between okay. team one and team two, if that's okay. Okay. Can we then take a question? I see Duncan. Um, uh, Duncan, I think you have a question. W would you like to ask your question? Which Duncan? There is another Duncan. Oh, probably. is there another Duncan? I, there is a Duncan who has raised um, his hand here. Unless, Duncan, is it your... Uh, I'm now confused. Okay, if it's not Duncan, then let's see. Is it? Um... I, there is a question there. I recently talked with newly qualified teachers about similar experiences or age, 11. Yes, um, we had the teachers from newly qualified teachers and more experienced teachers. Um, 
there were some issues, for example, with more experienced teachers in terms of technology, as we will be highlighting in the next section. So that that, that came across. Um, in terms of their, some newly qualified teachers felt a bit lost. I mean, they had started their um, academic year and quickly, you know, after a few months, it's, it's the formal kind. They had to go into a different context, so they did speak about that as well. Um, in terms of working with children, um, qualified, newly qualified teachers sometimes struggle to know who the teachers, who the children are and the families. So they needed support from other teachers that came across as well. Um, that's what I can remember now from the data. Okay, thank you, Duncan. I think there is a question from, um, is it Sue, Sue Nainard? W would you like to come in and ask your question or would you like me to ask it? She's asking about gender differences. Yes, do, do you want to answer that? Thank you. There wasn't there wasn't a particular uh, difference. We what was striking for us was um, the, the the longing for connection, um, which I think everybody as people felt. Um, but obviously, teachers in primary um, they felt that it was quite uh, uh, quite fundamental to their identity as teachers. Um, so I didn't think that there was a, a difference no, in, in no. gender. We, we, we had more um, female okay. teachers and had teachers participating in the study. And that obviously is a demographic of the primary school teachers. Um, but but we, we one of the head teachers, for example, uh, one teacher spoke about being committed more to the community and to the children and the students rather than to the family. Mm -hmm. It was a decision taken at his, you know, on his at his family that his wife should be taking care of their children whilst he should be committed and he was attending the hub mm -hmm. and he spoke of consistency at the hub and he said one of the problems of the hubs, it's not a problem, one of the, um, the hubs where does he over know have two, two sets of teachers were working in one day. So he said, I want to be there every day to provide children with some form of consistency. Mm -hmm. We will not be sharing um, data about the hubs per se, but we've gathered a lot of data mm -hmm. about what was going on in the hubs. It's quite exciting, quite challenging, and I think um, we'll maybe have another opportunity to share this. I think because of the time and because of the questions that there are, we, we should go on because if they're talking about accountability um, and and scrutiny, this is something we are going to talk about next. So shall I share the slide again? From our data, it comes across that at least our reading of it is that teachers were doing a lot for in this moment. Mm -hmm. And this is probably beyond the data, but in the sense, we know what, what's happening in the media and how media was reporting some situations. When we look at our data, we look at it, at the experience of teachers in a very positive way, at least that's our reading of the data. And um, obviously it's limited to the teachers that we have. That we have. And, and, um, and, we, our, and the teachers who spoke to us did speak about other teachers who were struggling in a very big way. Um, so I think there is a, a breadth of experience that obviously we, we did not capture um, in the way it, it happens with all kinds of research. Yes, question. That's about expectations as well. That's why I thought I would share the slide again. Here it is, I think. Would you, um, Danielle and Duncan, I was thinking, would you like to perhaps continue then? Because some of the themes perhaps uh, are coming yes. up as you're as you're continuing with your presentation so how about then if you if you continue with your presentation and then i'll have a look at, at the chat box and yes, i'll summarize main points and i'll bring um the main questions then in the end is that okay yes thank you thank you so, can you see thank the slide again much. now can you see the slide yes. again yes good okay. Um, in team two we'll we have two sub teams if i remember well i think mm -hmm. two sub teams um, we're focusing more on the teaching and learning in this in this in this team, and the first one is what probably a lot of teachers would know and would have experienced. That is that every teacher would have 
well, let's put it this way. There, were, there seems to be two ways of doing this. So there was a way of every teacher providing a daily timetable. Three tasks were given, were set up, were uploaded. The parents knew that, you know, um, which um, they were all differentiated. So the parents knew in which group the children were functioning. So it's three tasks, but differentiated tasks, um, which were numeracy, health and literacy. And they had to give feedback. So that was one way of doing it. The second way was to upload a weekly grid on Monday with some tasks and that was it, and then give some feedback at the end of the week. So we have these two different versions of um, how teachers were uploading material online. We were struck about you know these three, the first three quotes up there, and all the stuff is done at home while all the other stuff that happens at home is taking place. Yes. You have your own children, dependents, um, you know, uh, people reported needing to cook more because there was more being at home and etc. Oh, next slide. Oh. No, you're... Okay. Um, so, so there were some teachers and some schools who were more familiar with them with technology. So, for example, there were examples of schools who already were working on CISO or Microsoft Teams. There were schools where children had um, P from P5 to P7 had to take their iPads or the school provided iPads. So there was um, knowledge of how to use these online platforms by the teachers and by the children. Some of the schools reported that they had teachers who became more knowledgeable about these platforms prior to COVID. And so when COVID came about and, you know, the, the idea of when lockdown was, um, um, I would say, when lockdown, happened. when lockdown happened, they were quickly able to support the school, the schools to actually go online. What we are seeing, what we also came across is that several teachers struggled with technology. Mm -hmm. And here we have a whole spectrum of some are able to do minimal and some are able to do a lot. Some wanted to try things out, some were more reluctant, and this depended not only on age, but the time, but the experiences. And so we had a, a big variety Thank spectrum of, of comments here. But yes, there, was, there were several teachers who struggled with technology. This is linked to the next point where some head teachers who had a bit concern about this, as Daniel already spoke about that parents were being, were judging teachers according to their online presence. So there were teachers saying she is an excellent teacher. She is not performing, you know, um, really well online, but I know that she is excellent, but because she's not performing online, the teachers um, are, are being sort of unfairly judged, really. Um, and you had the opposite then, teachers who were not performing well at school, but they had a more online presence, which could be, you know, uploading a video of a drawing that they were doing and parents like that more. So here we have to keep in mind that the medium has changed. Mm -hmm. So from face to face in a classroom, which could involve also using technology to using technology. And let's not forget that the medium creates us and the teacher. So this is. Uh -huh. So the. the the importance of the connection again like with which we took for granted like we took the school building for granted connection needs to be given its time it needs to be given its attention when we are on when we are doing online learning because it uh, if you don't have a presence some kind of tasks some kinds of co of contact between the teacher and children make the teacher's presence felt more so Parents and families and, and, and children, um, according to teachers and head teachers, appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Also, what two things that came across was that the families got a deeper insight of the teaching and learning um, covered. Now, whether this reflects what they usually covered in school is difficult to judge. But certainly teachers knew more, parents knew more what was being um, taught by teachers. 
and this and and some were critic some teachers spoke about it that they were aware of this and they were also aware that some parents were critical of this mm -hmm. and especially um one head teacher spoke about this really really strongly said we have to make a, almost a distinction here between learning and learning opportunities when you for example upload a picture or a game from a website is it learning or are you providing a learning opportunity so so these are very interesting reflection what was going on there is it learning or learning um, opportunities and we there was a teacher speaking and saying you know if parents know when you are taking something ready made and you're just posting it up because they find it themselves so she had this conversation with us mm -hmm. which we thought was very powerful we also were we also were told by heads of teachers that they monitor the work posted online by the teachers mm -hmm. and here the kind of in-depth observations by heads came across very strongly and some heads were shocked at, at, at the handout that was one of the heads comments you know you say is this the handout you know that there's a spelling error there you know so so no, i don't think there was one in this particular case where she commented on it there were there were a few where yes because, not one. so yes so it was um there were there were a variety there were a variety of things but obviously because of the the medium and because of the, the posting in this particular case passed through the head then there was greater scrutiny um the last point in this slide teachers were aware that not all families had the same access mm -hmm. from internet access to tech to laptops ipads mm -hmm. and time and time there was a, a story told about a family who had one laptop between three children and it was also used by the parents so so for work so they had to, you know the parent had to do actually a timetable when each member of the family could access this yes and also um we had teachers and teachers were concerned about um for example issues of new teaching or consolidating teaching what if, um what what are we going to do how are we going to keep our children up to scratch if if we want to do that and um, if a teacher posted something new online um uh, we'll get back to that in a minute yes the last thing okay, though, was sorry. that because of the access um some fam some some schools were aware that for example only 60 percent of that class accessed that learning so they had this issue how are we going to make sure that all our children are you know th that everything that there is equity and that there is equality um we, we got this feeling that some were saying we're posting these online but because we don't have that one you know con connection with direct connection with children they felt stagnant they be became a repetitive thing so teachers said this but in a positive way teachers were also um, trying out new things new ideas the idea of i challenge myself came across um so in this part in the first quote the teachers the teacher is you know pasting um images of two books and the children vote which book she wants to read and she reads it she records it she puts it on her virtual library mm -hmm. so this goes beyond what maybe she needed to do but she felt that this was challenging her mm -hmm. the second quote there it's a very nice quote she um she, they lived on a croft they lived on a croft yes and, and she was she was she took some little videos of the croft and try to do, for example, numeracy and Numer literacy um, or in that way. And uh, she said, you know, the children are getting a little insight into 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 her life. Um, and also she needed, she sort of said it compensated for the fact that we're using the digital medium, but at the same time, then they're seeing a, a side of me which they wouldn't have seen. there were also some schools who moved from individual lessons to family activities so um for example literacy or in stem they would do an activity where um, they would engage the whole you know the all the siblings or the children within a family and um, this would give more time for parents rather than having to do two or three different activities with three different children you would do one activity that is family based also interesting that the, the teacher spoke about making uh, sure that the concept is being taught in the right, right way. way yes and um, 
especially okay. numeracy. That was a concern. Um, everybody said, you know, we can't expect parents to be teachers. Um, and that at the same time, how are we going to make sure that something is, is being taught in the right way? Um, this is the second part of this team focuses on expectations, expectations on behalf of teachers on their teaching and learning. And the first, there are not numerous expectations. So from the school, from the local authorities, from the Scottish government, from the union, from the media, there are a lot of people who had expectations what, per, what teachers should be doing. We are going to focus only on two, unfortunately, for in, in terms of today's presentation. The first comes from parents. There were parents who were transforming their dining room into kitchen, into classrooms. Yes. And this came across in a number of teachers. You know, you, you all of a sudden it seems that everyone is around and people, there are some parents who actually try to do a school day from nine till later on in the day. So there were parents who um, tried to, I'm sure from this quote, it's sure that they influenced teachers and in terms of what they had to do. And there were parents who switched off because the children perhaps were younger um, or perhaps they could not uh, cope with this. So um, head teachers in particular did report parents saying at the moment we're not doing this because it's not working for us. Yeah. Um, but interestingly is the second expectation that we're talking here about. Another huge one, sorry. Can I ask you, can we give you a minute to read this and then we'll half, go... Half a minute. Half a minute. Exactly. That's right, Gillian. It's you, 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 you find yourself almost torn, isn't it? It's quite laudable that the school has these high expectations and it's the kind of thing that I would want in my son's school, for example. And at the same time, in that circumstance, with those, you know, situations, you say, gosh, that that must have been a big pressure. It's it's what we try to show between these two, you know, um, this quote and the previous quote is that this is what qualitative data gives you. It's the richness of this quote where you say, OK, so what are the implications here? And and I think the last three or four words capture it. Nobody wants their child left behind. And this is policy discourse, mm -hmm. which comes across very clearly to this through this teacher's, you know, voice. She is trying to, you know, there was a, there are loads of references to the attainment gap. Yes. Now whether the attainment gap has actually widened or we, we can't know that this from this research, but a lot of teachers we're at that concerned. moment were very concerned about the attainment gap. Mm -hmm. So 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 it comes across repetitively in the interviews. And what this quote to you know contextualize this quote within the attainment gap discourse and no child left behind, you know, it, it yeah. The last um, the, yes, um, the issue uh, we already mentioned about the issue of not teaching new material and and using material that was previously taught. We find a difference between interviews before Easter and after Easter. Mm -hmm. So before Easter, it seems that everyone was thinking this is a three week thing. It's a you pause. know, it's a pause until Easter. Then by Easter, we will be back in schools and things will be different. The interviews after Easter, and this is where the, the, the timeline becomes interesting, we're looking and saying, how can we um, continue doing the things that we were doing prior to Easter? Can we do not come up with something new? And we have a, a number of teachers telling us, you know, that they were, they knew that they had, they... It was, they, 
we knew that there was going to be a wobble. We yes. were going to wobble. Staff are going to wobble. Parents are going to wobble. So we need to see how we're going to um, uh, handle this. Perhaps prior to it's okay. And we have this quote from this teacher saying, I felt the need to do something new. And this. And that's what she did. So I think this is our um, presentation. We really struggled to <laughs> limit it. Um, and I'm glad that we. We sort of stayed within the time, although I'm not going to look at J Diane in the face. We said um, we're launching the website soon. We're hoping to publish the papers. Um, obviously, beyond this research, we are continuing to, uh, to be interested in the impact on teacher identities. And, and this is what we're trying to bring out in our papers, how this experience has to say something about teacher's identity, which is which goes beyond lockdown yes because i think there were moments that are interesting so much part of who the teacher is or the teacher how the teacher is being and becoming that you know this could be interesting points to take after covid mm -hmm. um we want to remind you that our contact emails are at the front um, of the powerpoint and we want to say how big a privilege it has been to be given these glimpses into teachers' experiences um, and also to work alongside colleagues within the School of Education. Um, and we appreciate being given the space. Thank you, Sarah. And that is us. I will stop sharing. <laughs>